Hello and welcome to my podcast. Do me a favor, subscribe to the John Com Report. Wherever you get your podcast, you're watching on YouTube, hit that like button, hit that subscribe button. You can find us there as part of Empire Media. That's A-M-P-I-R-E, you know that. Always much appreciated when you tune in. And don't forget, you can read my work on ESPN.com. I'll have a story up. Uh, let's see, what today I'm recording Wednesday night. This comes out Thursday morning. So probably Friday or so on just some of the pass protection issues and just where it all stems. And obviously we've talked a lot about how Sam Howell's role, but there it goes beyond that. And so obviously, so going to have something on that for, I believe it is for Friday. So there you go. Look for that. Now in a few minutes, I'm going to be joined by former Washington tight end turned commanders analyst, Logan Tom, excuse me, Logan Thomas, Logan Paulson. Sorry about that, Logan. It's Logan Paulson. Logan Thomas is the one who's still playing, and I'll get to him in about 30 seconds. Anyway, Logan Paulson and I discussed what could what's going on with the protection from a many tip, many different angles. Again, not just like, oh, is Sam holding too long or not? What can be done? So we know you have that we know they have a young quarterback. We know that the line has some issues, et cetera. So what can be done to improve the situation? And just looking at it from multiple angles, really good discussion with Logan Paulson. And I hope you stay tuned for that. Get it, get some knowledge out of that because I thought he was very insightful. And I went in that direction rather than kind of talking more about the Eagles. We do get them to the Eagles a little bit at the end, but rather than having an Eagles reporter on, because I think this is such a big topic that I wanted to get you guys informed. And I asked some questions that we were asked the other day, Bram and I on the live stream show about maybe something's going wrong. So I wanted to ask Logan about that as well, because he's smarter than me, a lot smarter than me. So anyway, there you go. Um, so stay tuned for that. Before I get to that, a couple of things. Tight end Logan Thomas was a limited participant in practice, but he was out there in full pads doing some bag work before, just some contact with the bag work, or you know, just blocking bags and all that. So, you know, certainly looks good for him, but um, see where this goes, because there's always... With concussions, you never know, but he was out there. Good sign. There you go. A um, lot of questions today about Sam Howell. And of course, and just like, how is he, how is he handless? What are you looking for? Et cetera, et cetera. And I think one of the things that Ron Rivera talked about is something that this is why I don't worry about, well, is he going to, how is that game going to impact him? He's a resilient kid, and it's the the strength of his, the strength of his game or a strength of his game has always been his demeanor how he doesn't let things bother him. Terry McLaurin talked about this, something I've talked about, but also written about, which is before this game, every time he'd have a bad series or a bad play in previous games, he'd always respond with a really good drive, whether it led to points or put them in position to points. And whether it was a missed field goal or a fumble, he put them in position for points because of how he bounced back from a bad drive. I certainly expect him to bounce back. A lot of good examples of a lot of good plays in the first couple in his first three starts, and you don't ignore that with because of one bad start. And yes, there are things he has to clean up. Anyway, so but he knows that and um, talked to Hal about that. And I wanted to give you one one quote that he gave, and I wanted to say I'm going to read it off my phone here because you know there's a, again a lot of talk about this is only his fourth start now. I can talk about that. The coaches are going to talk about that. The one guy who doesn't want to hear that is Sam Howell. So here's what he said. He was asked if he, if he found solace in the fact that he's a young quarterback and that, he, and that this was only his fourth start. And, he's, and his quote was, honestly, no, I don't make any excuses for myself. I expect to play much better than I played on Sunday. And my teammates in this organization deserves for me to play better than I played on Sunday. And I just got to do a better job. I can't go out there and make the excuse that I'm young because the teams were playing. They don't care. The scoreboard doesn't care. So I got to do my job at a higher level in order for this team to go where we want to go. I'm excited to get back out there on Sunday, end of quote. And so that's something he talked about, just that he was excited to get back out there. He said he started looking, thinking about this next game because he just, not just because you want to get this one out of his head, but it's another chance to go out and compete, show what you can do, et cetera. So I don't, I don't worry about how he's going to bounce back and, I don't think any players do either. Now, another topic that was in the locker room, or actually one other topic that one other person that Ron Rivera was asked about was Emmanuel Forbes. And just kind of just his assessment of, of where he's at in his game. He's been their third corner. They they love Benjamin St. Juice and Kendall Fuller on the outside. And they move St. Juice inside when they bring Forbes in. Um, one of the things to me that, you know, Forbes is, 
Forbes is a willing tackler when he's coming around, but he's not a physical player. And so I, I wonder sometimes with their corners, how much that impacts what he does. But the bottom line is Kendall Fuller is really good in the zone match, very smart player. And, and Benjamin St. Juice is a really good player. So right now Forbes will be their third corner, but St. Juice goes inside. So what Rivera said, said he's got a tremendous skill set, great quicks, great plant and drive, but his footwork and his body position can be better. So, you know, and, and you look also at, and Rivera brought up his production in the SEC. Obviously, they really like him a lot because they drafted him. But anyway, so people wondering what's going on there. Some of that is what goes on. And, uh, you know, he'll get more time. And he'll certainly, Kendall Fool is a free agent after the season. So you would expect Forbes to be there next year, next to St. Juice as the outside corners. And um, then also... Terry McLaurin was asked about the amount of targets he's getting or not getting. And same with Jahan Dotson and, you know, just how they handle that. And McLaurin is very matter of fact about it. And he knows that it's a young season. It's only been three games and you don't go and make waves. Cause one thing he doesn't want to do is create waves and create a situation with a quarterback, especially a young one where you're looking, you're just more worried about what this guy getting upset about. Listen, when Kirk Cousins was first starting here and he had Pierre Garcon and Deshaun Jackson, they gave him some earfuls. And, you know, they, they're highly competitive, highly successful receivers. And so there were times where I think people here wanted Kirk to kind of stand up to them, but they were going to be very vocal about what they needed or what, what they wanted to get. McLaurin's not like that. So that, I think, is something that's one reason why they really like this guy, McLaurin, because he is that kind of a leader. He also said that a couple of years ago, he did say something one time, got some pushback on it, and realized that maybe it's not always the best thing to do. Um, they clearly know what they have McLaurin, and they need to find ways to get him more involved. But also, there are little things like, <clears throat> I think there's still some things that Howell is learning about McLaurin and playing with him, and when you can go to him in situations the guy makes a lot of contested catches and i think heineke was very well aware of that and would get him the ball because of that and i think that's something that how they're still building up some of that trust and there's still some times where on particular plays where if mclaurin and, and how had more time together they could maybe make some adjustments on the fly that would lead to more situations for big plays for mclaurin because there have been times where they've seen it where he has seen a coverage it's like if they were further advanced in that relationship, that they may both be on that same quote unquote same page like a Kelsey and Mahomes. Those guys are Hall of Fame players, but the part of the thing is that they play together and they're both smart players and they see it. And so when you get to that point, you can make some off schedule or backyard type plays where you just like, hey, I'm going to go down here and just do this, right? And you just know from look, they're not clearly not there yet. That's part of the growth of them working together but it's something that McLaurin knows can happen eventually. And then the last thing is one of the, again, for that going back to the pass rush stuff and the O-line and talking to some of the O-line guys, interior guys, and then just what they can do to help. How can you, okay, you have a young quarterback and we know not all the sacks are on the offensive line. Certainly some are, and the protection needs to be better. So what can you do to help him? And so that was some of the stuff. And certainly with the interior guys, they know because how's a shorter quarterback, they need to do a better job of, of, anchoring and giving him a little bit more space in front of them to complete some of those throws. And so that would help as well. Anyway, that's it for me. That's my little Wednesday update report. Now let's get to my conversation with former Washington tight end Logan Paulson talking about the protection and a few other issues, taking also a little bit of look at the Eagles defense as we get ready for Sunday. But don't, don't forget, I'll be back on Friday, Friday night with my keys predictions the video with you come out Friday night, Saturday morning. So I'll talk to you next time. Logan, always appreciate you ha having you on. And the big thing I want to talk about is the protection. And, you know, obviously protection encompasses more than just the offensive line. It's receivers at the right splits, running the right routes. It's quarterback yeah. it's ball. It's the offensive line. So I am curious though, from your perspective, and by the way, people should know you and Craig put on the, on the take command pie on take command podcast, put out your film review on Wednesday, correct? Yeah. What is Yeah. Wednesday. Mm -hmm. Okay. That's right. So people can go, can go look at that. So anyways, in general, 19 sacks through three games is way too many. Right. Yeah. A lot of hits. Mm -hmm. 
how do you, when you're looking at that, what's going wrong? Yeah, I mean, I think the the main thing that I think a lot of people need to understand is that like pass protection is like a symbiotic relationship between the offensive line and the quarterback. And I think people have talked about that at nauseum at this point, but that is an important factor in terms of having effective pass pro. Like you look at some of the, what have traditionally been the the most effective pass protecting offensive lines. I don't think it's any coincidence that they're with guys like Tom Brady, Peyton Manning, Drew Brees, guys who understand kind of the importance of getting the ball out with a rhythm and timing that is conducive to good pass protection. And so what I mean by that is like, you know, the offensive line is designed to kind of cultivate a pocket, you know, whether you've got tight ends or backs, we want a pocket for the quarterback to be able to throw the football. That's pretty obvious, but it's the, that pocket is cultivated around a launching spot, which is approximately seven, six, six, seven yards, depending on the coach. And um, <clears throat> if the quarterback deviates from that position, basically it makes it very, very challenging for the offensive line excuse me, to, to effectively pass pro. And so that's one element. And I think Sam Howell in certain instances, like against Denver, for example, he gets pressure from the left. He vacates hard to the right. And Leno's guy is able to kind of take this really, really high angle around to get to the sack because the quarterback is not in a good relationship to the offensive lineman. And that's challenging, right? That's challenging for a young player. Also holding on to the football is another thing that's very challenging for the offensive line, right? And so, again, like when you look at Tom Brady as an example, like he does a masterful job of understanding kind of based on the coverage where the ball needs to go right now. So to me, it's that's kind of the crux of, of most of the issues. Like if there's a guy like, for example, if Kirk Cousins is in this offense, I don't think we're talking about the pass protection issues the same way we're talking about. Because when you watch Minnesota's offensive line, for example, like they're not a great group. They're, they're not a very talented group. Now, Kirk gets hit a ton but they're not taking a lot of sacks. So all those pressures and quarterback hits that the offensive line is giving up in Minnesota don't statistically show up as sacks. And I think that number, that sack number is really strongly correlated to having a young guy at the quarterback spot. And and that, you know, and we talk about this too. And my thing is like, it just seems like a tough combo. We have a line that, yeah. you know, you may need a veteran quarterback behind it with a young quarterback who may need a better line in front of him to give him that trust and time. Yeah, and it's one of those things where, like, I look at this group and I look at this offensive line, and and if if they're with, you know, a different quarterback, a top 15 quarterback, a veteran quarterback like you alluded to, I don't think we, we're even talking about them. I really don't. I mean, that's how well I think they've played. Now, they're not, for example, like when you watch Cleveland's offensive line, Deshaun Watson standing back there for three seconds looking like he's, you know, in a perfectly pristine white jersey, like that is something that Sam Howell probably needs. But if you look at the cultivation of that group, right, they've got a lot of draft capital, a lot of money right. invested in that group, and the product is very good. Look at other offensive lines, you know, look at the Chargers, look at anybody, right? Um, Seattle, like their offensive line is average, but it's elevated by good quarterback play. And I think w this this organization perhaps kind of said, you know, analytically, this is a really good, this is an interesting kind of talking point analytically you just need average offensive line play so like that old saying like sees that get degrees that's super applicable for the offensive line if you've got a quarterback who's got some type of experience and can elevate that group if you've got a young guy who's going to hold the ball a long time you need better pass protectors so i do think it's kind of this this unfortunate situation because i think the offensive line is talented enough um but i think some of their deficiencies are exacerbated by a quarterback who's who's still learning how to play the position at the nfl level and, you know, the, the, you don't want to overreact to one game. The problem right. is the hits and the sacks are three games. Yeah. You know, Sam did a good job in some of the other games. And, would, you know, it's not about all of that, but it is about the sacks. It's just too many. Yeah. So when you look at it from a coaching perspective, what could be done? Is it more, can they change the launch angle a little bit more? Can they do things to help him out as he learns and still make plays? Yeah, I mean, obviously, there's a ton you can do. I think one of the things is, so what it's it's hard to say specifically because there's so many things that go into good pass protection. And so, like, one of the things is just saying, hey, Sam, like, check the ball down. Like, on the first interception of the game, the first sack he takes, like, just get the ball to the flat. Like, there's no, yeah. don't, don't need to be a hero. Just, like, let's live to play it down. Let's understand the situation of the game. Like, that stuff is stuff that Sam can get better at, right? Also, I think there's certain concepts where like I see I see what they're trying to do, but I'm kind of like, is the receiver too wide here? Is the receiver, can he be a little bit tighter? Can he be a little bit quicker to his position so that Sam 
so that the receiver's coming into his vision at the right time so that Sam can get the ball out. Those things are things that, you know, come as you detail an offense, especially with young football players. So I think that's something, again, that could help Sam elevate. And that's something small, right? That's just that's running the same plays, just with little slightly different details um, from the receivers in order to get them in the right positions, right? So I think that's one thing, too. I also think, you know, changing the launch angle, more keepers, more um, more sprint outs, like those types of things are they a lot of coordinators kind of shy away from them because they cut the field in half. Right. And I understand. And, and I'm reluctant, you know, in high school, I'm reluctant to do that because I don't want to take away half of the field. But I also understand that those are easy throws. Right. And when you're looking for easy throws and easy completions and confidence building plays for the quarterback, those can be really, really helpful. You know, and I think that those are, again, very easy things. You look at Kyle, what he does with young quarterbacks. That's a huge feature, not necessarily the sprints, but the keeper right? Because you get the defense going one way, you create big throwing windows, you help the protection out. And um, so that's awesome. You know, the thing you can do is probably run a little bit more play action. Not that um, EB has been totally without play action, but I think just increasing the frequency of that type of play call. Like I just look at the bills, man, they ran a ton of play action and play action does a good job of mitigating rushes and, and, but- and dampening rushes. Yeah. Do you think Sam, like one thing I wonder about, because when you watch Josh Allen with his play fakes, a little bit different than when you watch Sam. A little bit different, but also like. Does that one matter? Of the, one of the things with a play action, for example, like obviously the fake is really important and it helps kind of manipulate the second level. But one of the things the run action does do is it helps the offensive line get sticky on defensive linemen because they, instead of having to, you know, avoid blocks like they would when you're trying to pass protect, they have to take on blocks. And because they're in such close proximity, usually, especially if everyone's got their hand in the dirt, sometimes, you know, with those stand up three, four outside linebacker guys, they can see the formation, the ball, the ball fake becomes more important. But when those guys got their hands on the ground, like they did against Buffalo, they can't really see. So you can just jump out, give them an aggressive set, make them feel run. They attack you like it's a run. And then you kind of win the down. You've already added a second and a half to the to pass protection. Rep. So I, I think, yes, like, the ball fake's important, but for the offensive line and protection, which is kind of what we're talking about, I think it still has value. Okay, you know? so and it's just it's, about selling it. I, I think so, yeah. But, and, and you know, obviously, the to me, the ball fake is more for the second le- second right. and third levels of the defense. Um, and obviously, you, you see the effect of that with, you know, the greats like Peyton Manning had one of the best ball fakes of all time. He could manipulate defenses and secondaries all day. He, Sam's not there yet with that, but I'm more, we're, we're talking more about the protection. Right. I do think that would elevate. So those are a couple of things. I think finding, you know, like, for example, even I go back to the Buffalo game, some quick game. I thought EB did a better job of sprinkling quick game in early and often in this game, which I love. Everyone kind of thinks about those five yard sits to Terry, those five yard sits to Cole. Um, I think Jahan had one as well. Those are great. Those are easy. Get the ball out of your hand quick. Also, they ran a couple like kind of little bubble screens. I'm talking about Buffalo now. Again, just the opportunities for easy throws where the ball is in my hands for a count and the ball's out. Now you have to make sure you're ahead of the sticks. You have to make sure you're on schedule. All those things are important, but those are some things you can definitely utilize to get the ball in the quarterback's hand more quickly and alleviate the kind of high stress pass protection downs for the O line. And I think that's really what we're talking about. If it's a play action, if it's a quick game, if it's a screen, um, those downs are considered considered relatively easy for the offensive line. It's when you get into the five step, sure. seven step, non play action, pure drop back stuff that becomes more challenging. And I think I've been a little surprised at the frequency that they've kind of engaged in pure drop back passing, but it's been, it's been effective through the first three games for the most part. So I, I can't be too critical of that. Well, and that's what I was going to ask you too, because along with that, like even watching Josh Allen the other day, he did some play action and then took seven step drops yeah. and he's, and he's avoiding at times what looked like it would have been a, if you're facing a, a five-step drop, it's a good pass rush. Instead, he's getting a pass off. But yeah. the other thing I want to look at too is, and I was looking at some stats on True Media today, and you have to contextualize these stats when you see it. I don't, you yeah. know, with the analytics, you always have to contextualize. <laughs> and that's why I wanted to ask you because sometimes the numbers don't tell all. They give you a sense. And it, to me, it gives you, they give you a direction to go ask questions. Yeah. But Washington or, um, Hall has thrown more passes out of a five step five man protection than anybody else. Yeah. Number two is Patrick Mahomes, yeah. same system. <laughs> so, and I know that they chip out of those two, right? Yeah. And some of those five step five man protections, a lot of them are the quick throws, right? Mm. So I'm wondering, is that what do you think about the protection schemes and just how many times they use 
extra men in protection, whatever. And sometimes I know it could be a guy he's maybe supposed to help, but he's going to release because nobody's coming. So I understand sure. that there's not just, it's not just straight five man protection calls. It could encompass a lot of things. Yeah. And I think, you know, talk about kind of alleviating some stress on the quarterback. I think there's a lot of people that think, oh, you know, we want more protections. We want tighter formations, tighter formations, create muddy looks, right? Really is what it does. Right. So like when you think about like Kyle's offenses, for example, they got tight ends and fullbacks and, and all of a sudden that coverage structure is like really amorphous and not very declared. And so one of the things about empty that you love as a coordinator, and I think you probably love as a quarterback is it lets you identify who's blitzing, what the coverage is, where the space is, it creates space, right? Because just by default, all of a sudden you're defending 53 blades of grass horizontally because you've got more eligibles displaced. So I think as a lot of people say, oh no, you can't do that with a young quarterback, but I actually think there's advantages to it, right? I just think about some of the quick game they ran from, from it was, it was five, there were five protectors, right? right? So you have five eligibles, um, five guys out in routes. And those little stick, little hitch throws are so easy because, of how the coverage is declared pre-snap. And he gets so, rid of it quick on those. Yeah, absolutely. And I think even for some of the deeper dropback stuff, like this O-line has done a pretty good job of kind of giving a pocket that's, you know, obviously for Arizona and I would say um, Denver, a pretty good job of creating pockets where you can kind of find those holes and find explosive plays because – you know, unfortunately, with a young quarterback, especially one that has a tendency to take sacks, the way to counteract that is to find big explosive chunks. So I don't have a huge problem with it. I think I think the thing that I have a problem with, maybe if I was being hypercritical here, is just the frequency, right? Like if you're doing one thing all the time, people can get a beat on you. You know, they can right. dial up protections uh, or blitzes, excuse me, that beat your protections and attack your rules. And I think that's the thing is like I always think of good play callers. Um, and, I, and I've been really pleased with EB's play calling, honestly, as guys that know how to kind of punch and counter punch, right? And and kind of get the defense unsettled and get them uncertain as to what you're doing. If you have a tendency like that, I think that tends to allow defenses to prepare and kind of cultivate a very specific game plan for what you do really well. And I and again, I don't think what they're doing is a bad thing, but I think there is maybe a, a little bit of diversity that could be added that could alleviate some of the down to down stress on the offensive line potentially. And again, like I think this empty stuff that they've been doing has been actually really beneficial for Sam in terms of his development and ability to see throws. It's just about, do you agree with the, the frequency with which they're engaging with it? Yeah. And you know, it's funny because when they've gone empty, he does get rid of the ball fast. And so yeah. like, I don't, the empty sets haven't been an issue because he does it because it is defined and he is getting rid of it. It's, it's if they're five man out of a certain look and now it's a drop back, but the other, I'm sorry, you were, no, no, I was just going to say, like, it, because I think they do so much empty, they do do quick game, but they also do five steps and they also yeah. do other stuff out of that. So maybe you bring down the percentage of five steps. I, you know, I don't know. And it's hard. That statistics hard right. to know what is the three step, what's the five step, what screens are they running out of it? Right. But um, I think just going off of kind of my gut instinct with no numbers to support it, I feel like they do do a lot of five step. Yeah. Out of empty and it does create big plays and it does create good throwing windows which is awesome but it also stresses the offensive line so like that's kind of the give and take of that uh do you think and this is maybe i don't better a question for the enemy but you know he's <laughs> going from kansas city to here it's a different while it's the same system far different personnel etc yeah. you know what's the challenge for a coordinator when you're, you know, this is your system and you, but you're going from here to here with Mahomes then to a young quarterback is uh, do, do, do you think he's still kind of learning what these guys can do? Yeah, absolutely. I think that's entirely possible. I think, you know, when you've been in a system for a long time with a certain personnel with a specific quarterback, you got to learn what like mere mortals can do a little <laughs> bit and like, you know, what young players can handle. And I think one of the things we often forget, or at least I forget when I'm evaluating this team is you've got, very young players playing huge roles in this offense. You've got two very young guards. You've got a young quarterback. You've got a young running back. You've got a young second receiver, right? You've got, and you know, even Diami who gets reps too. Like you've got young players learning, learning this offense and learning the details of this offense. So I think there's a lot going on there. And, you know, I do think AB's made adjustments, uh, you know, just observationally for, and, and, right. and kind of innovated from what he's done in Kansas city to support Sam. Like, the pre-snap motion here has come way down and people say, Oh, well, right. that's, that's not good. But I actually think that's probably helping Sam How? because one of the, th one of the things like with a motion, for example, let's say we're in a two by two and we're motioning to a three by one. 
like I have to be able to not only articulate that in the huddle and explain and get that verbiage out, but also like I have to understand like how that affects the concept because it's now out of a three by one and how the coverage is going to change as a result, as opposed to these static photos that you get from like the pre-snap, the, 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 the traditional pre-snap that they're getting now. Because I So I do think there are benefits to kind of simplifying the picture for Sam and making sure he's very comfortable with what he's seeing pre and post snap and not including motion is a benefit because like while motion does a lot of great stuff for your offense it also can make the picture more complicated and I know a lot of quarterbacks prefer just hey I want to be in the gun I want to see a static picture because then I can identify blitzers I can identify coverage structure I can identify matchups in a more advantageous way to me and I and I would guess that that's something EB is engaging with because they were so motion heavy right. when he was in Kansas City right no, and you know, it's, I'm glad you brought that up because I was wondering about that too. Because you don't see it, I haven't seen it as much as you would think. And I know that it's funny because I know, and even some receivers don't like a lot of motion either. Yeah, and and so it's not like it can be really good. I know, like you know, certain coaches are going to love it. You know, Sean yeah. and Kyle, those yeah. guys are going to love it, but not not everybody does. So, what about the simulated the the simulated pressures, the simulated blitzes? There, you know, and I don't know. I mean, certainly some of those have worked. Yeah. What is the yeah. challenge with reading those and how effective you think those are? So really with a simulated pressure, you're just trying to get the benefits of a pressure with right. adding a guy into coverage, you know? So instead of bringing five, like you would traditionally, you're bringing four and you're just changing the pattern. So like, for example, like we just talked about five man protection. So in a five man protection, you have a man side, which is a two man side and a slide side, which is the three man side and the slide side. All that means is that's the direction the center is going to push. And so in a, in a slide, in a, in a five man protection, the center is going to, you're going to have a rule for the week, you know? So we're going to go to the three technique. We're going to go to the field with the slide. We're going to go to number 43 with the slide, whatever it is. Right. And so in this game, I'd say that their rule is probably, they're going to go to number 91. He's their best interior pass rusher. Let's make sure we can store that up on the inside. When you have a rule like that, excuse me, the defense now can, can say, how do we attack the two man side? How do we attack the man side? Traditionally, what you would do, it's say, hey, let's just put another defensive lineman over there and have a three-man rush on two pass protectors. But offenses are much more nuanced now. They can just say, no, we're not going to do that. We're going to send the slide to the three-man slide to the three-man rush side and block it up. But now with the simulated pressure, you can balance it up. You can have two on the left side of the offensive line, uh, on the left side of the center, two on the right side of the center. And then once the slide is declared, let's say we're going sliding to the right, we're sliding that Oliver number 91. You bring the linebacker over to the left, which is the man side. And now you have a three man rush on a two man protection while dropping one of the ends out. And so ideally you'd want them to bounce that back the offensive line. You want the tackle to set the end. And then once that guy drops, you want him to set the three, the guard bounce back, but it just takes too long. Right? So it, it basically challenges the rules of the protection. Cause if you bring that same pressure to the slide side, you pick it up and you don't even think twice about it. Right. So really the, the one where Sam throws the interception in the game is they've the defense has made a really good call. They've got they understand where the slides going of the five man protection and they bring the 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 simulated pressure, the three man rush to the two man side. And they're short because offensive linemen are coached when they're to the man side. You squeeze the most interior rusher, leaving the widest rusher to run free to the quarterback. That's the quarterback's guy. And Sam, like in his presser, made it very clear that he didn't understand the protection call in that moment, or he didn't understand the check. And obviously he didn't know there was going to be a free rusher. So that that's one of the challenges of a of a of a simulated pressure is that you get the benefits of a of a five of a blitz while adding a guy into right. coverage. And so I think that's in that specific look, um, obviously that's a very challenging one because they kind of get you. And that's one of the things that you look at and you say, well, what are they doing? What is Washington doing pre-snap to account for some of that stuff? And what I mean by that is like when you played, when I played with Kirk, for example, in a third down situation or a two minute situation, not necessarily two minute, but like in, in an obvious passing situation, he would go on a dummy cadence. He would go like white 80, white 80 said hut. And then he would let the pressure declare. He'd let them show their blitz. He'd tell the center, Hey man, I want to, I want the slide this way. The center would adjust, they'd pick it up and he could throw the football. And so like, you know, I was with Matt Ryan, every third down was on a dummy, some type of dummy. So like he could get the protection called because defenses have to show. And so when I look at 
what they're doing now. Again, that's one of the things of having a young quarterback that's very, very challenging is you're probably going on a very regulated cadence and you're probably not doing a lot in terms of allowing him to adjust protections because he probably is not overly familiar with it. And I'm not saying he can't do it. It's just right. that comes with time and experience. This so. is, And this is all part when, when, when you talk about growing pains, I guess, it's all it's you, you don't throw everything at a kid all at once. Right. And yeah. this is all part of it. Yeah. It's like, you know, that you hear that expression, like getting the keys to the car, like protection stuff is, is like big time keys to the car stuff. Cause like, what do you, what do you try to do early with a quarterback? At least in my experience, obviously everyone's going to be different, but as you say, the center is going to handle the protection call for now. So you can focus on where the football needs to go. And as you get more and more comfortable we give you more and more responsibility and the protections are a big thing, like really great quarterbacks that I've played with, you know, Deshaun Watson, when he was in Houston, when he was at the peak of his powers was excellent at dummy cadence, getting the protection called and, and, and getting the offensive line set. Matt Ryan was excellent. Kirk, like the last year I was here with him was just starting to get to that element of his game. So I think, um, I think again, that he's a young player. This is very, you know, everyone talks about running backs having a hard time with pass protection, like quarterbacks. This is another huge Big element deal. of the position that people don't think about. Yeah. Yeah. No, it, this is why I say like, there's a lot, there's a, like, you know, it's funny because I was rewatching some of the first two games and JT O'Sullivan does the quarterback school. I oh, a great yeah. breakdown of it. I love it. I wanted to have him on and he's like, he's, he can't do it. He's just way too swamped with it, but his breakdowns are fantastic. And I was watching some of the stuff they talked about, like the Denver game and or mm -hmm. both the first two games, like there's a lot of good stuff to build on, yeah. but this is also part of it. You have to, the, the negative stuff is going to come with that. Sure. And so it's all one piles on top of the other to create what you're going to be eventually. What about, I, I don't know. I, do you want to comment on that or? No, I think that's a hundred percent right. I think like, excuse me. With any young football player, they're going to develop, you know, they're going to get better. And they're part of getting better is getting worse at times and learning. Like, for example, that that Broncos defense, not Broncos, the, the Bills defense is really talented. Like on that pressure we were just discussing, like they have the flat defender running from a half field safety position to the flat. You know, and like, how often has he seen that? And how often does, do defenses in the NFL do that? They do it pretty regularly, but that defense has been together for like five years and they're going to make you look worse because of their experience and because of their understanding of where they're weak and, and of the coverages. So I think to, to your point, like he has done some really, really great stuff, Sam, yeah. but he's got to grow, you know, he's got to improve. And that doesn't happen. This is his fourth game playing quarterback in the NFL. Like, come on, man. Like, um, it's gonna, it's, it's gonna be a long process for him. And, um, I'm really happy with what he's done, but also like, he's got to get better. And I think he'd tell you the same thing. So, and, and there was, you know, just last part on that, there was another blitz that they brought off the other edge later in the game where yeah. he gets it to Antonio right away. Yeah. And yeah. So he like, did a great you know, job. With and that. it wasn't exactly this because the, the, the rotation was not the same, but he yeah. got rid of it right away and he recognized it. And so that's good. What about like another thing that we, we taught you and I talk about others ask about it. How much would it help to run the ball a little bit more? Because we're not talking, you're not going to flip it, but how right. much? And I also know sometimes with these passes, they're designed as the extended handoffs or this and that. Yeah. But could, would that help? Could that help? I mean, it could help, but I also think you don't want to be the New York Jets this last weekend and say, oh, our quarterback can't play football and we're going to run right. the ball into bad looks. I think one of the things that fan that I, I even after the game was a little bit duped by because I'm like, man, B Rob's average at seven yards of carry, Gibson's average at eight and a half, man. They should have run the they should have run the ball a little bit more, right? But when I look at it, what they did in the first half is is I think the the Buffalo Bills did a great job of saying, man. We know they're going to want to run the ball. We're going to be in a lot of single high structure plus looks in the run game and basically make them pass. And then in the second, and if you look at the first half rushing efficiency, it's not great. I think they average like two and a half yards a carry or something like that. Nothing. But nothing. Robinson great. did a little bit better than that. Yeah, but but it wasn't like it was right. like he had a couple of neutral runs. He had a couple non runs. Right. He had a five yard gain. It wasn't like right. It wasn't the same efficiency you saw in the second half. And one of the reasons you see a better efficiency in the second half is because they're in a lot of cover two structures, right? right? They're in light boxes. And that's mathematically like when you should run the football. And in the second half of the Bills uh, of the Broncos game was very, very similar coverage structures. So I think, yes, you can be more deliberate with running the football. But I also think, I believe the more I watch NFL football, not just the commanders, but around the league, 
you want to make sure you're running into good looks. Right. And because you want to make sure you maximize those touches. Like, I don't want to be the Tennessee Titans and having Der- Derrick Henry run, you know, all of his runs into eight man boxes and him get hit by the line of scrimmage for losses every single time. Like, that's just not effective football. Because if we do that on first down, it's second and 12. And now our quarterback is in a hole and not going to look very good because the defense knows exactly what we're going to do. So I think understanding kind of the rhythm and the sequence of an effective run game and how it can complement the pass game, I think is important. Now, if you want to increase it by five carries in the first half, like I'm okay with that, but I also think you want to make sure they're going into good looks. And I think about when Kyle was here in the four and you know, when I watched the 49ers, they don't run into bad looks, but they give Brock Purdy a lot of dexterity at the line of scrimmage to make checks hey, it's two safeties, or it's an advantageous look. We want to run into this look. They give it to us. Let's get to that run right now. And I think that's something that maybe if you want a more efficient run game, you could employ. But obviously that's something that Kyle does and that that tree does very well. And Andy Reid, I think they do that, but not with the same kind of emphasis as some of these other teams. So, you know, like you bring in EB because he's coming from an offense that's, that's beautifully choreographed from a pass game standpoint. If you wanted to bring someone in from Kyle Street, it's because you want to kind of incorporate the run game a little bit more. Like this is who EB is. He's he's a he's a really smart guy, really good coordinator, but also like he's a guy that's going to throw the ball a lot. And I'm okay with that because I think there is an efficiency, especially in 2023 NFL, yeah. with that. Yeah, and and you know it's funny because one of the runs too, I think it was the second. I think his first one was out of an RPO. Yeah. Um, and you know, and it and it did all right. So, but that's also reading the box and all that. The yeah. last thing. The last thing I want to ask you about then too is because they obviously have the Eagles this weekend and that's a very good front against the run. They're really good. You know, what surprised me is their pressure numbers aren't that great. Right. And I think they only, and it's not a comment on it, but it's just, again, looking at the numbers yeah. and do the numbers tell you the story, but it's six sacks. Um, they, they rank low in quarterback hits, Yeah. Um, but they, but they also have the seventh fastest time before, um, before a pass. Yeah. quarterback so in other words they're getting rid of the ball a little bit quicker but their pressure rate is low too how do you interpret that because what you know they have a lot of talent in that line and so that's why i'm wondering this matchup how that looks to you yeah i think they've played teams that understand <clears throat> understand what philly is right they played new england new england ran the ball a ton minnesota has kirk and say what you want about kirk he understands how to get the ball out of his hands quickly and obviously they played Tampa Bay last night, you know, whatever, uh, not, not, or whatever night that was a couple right. nights ago. So I think they played some teams that make it hard to rush the passer, uh, quite honestly. But also I think that they are a team that they don't win quickly in the, in, in as pass rushers, right? You've got Fletcher Cox, who's a power rusher. You've got Jordan Davis, who has been playing very, very well, but is a power rusher, right? You've got Jalen Carter who wins quickly, but even some of that stuff is a little bit messy. Josh Sweat, I think can win quickly. Brandon Graham, power rusher, right? So they do a good job of collapsing pockets, but it's not like, you know, I'm trying to think of a good example. It's not like TJ Watt who's going to create like these quick wins right now. So I do think that there is an element that like, yes, they're going to rush the rest of the passer well. Yes, they'll rush well against this team, especially if you give them a lot of tells and a lot of opportunity to rush the passer. But I think the teams they've played so far understand, understand that that's where their bread is buttered and have game planned accordingly. And I think, this team will game plan accordingly to account for the rush. And I also think it's important to know the style of rush you're going to get. It's not like this crazy, you know, quick win type of group. It's they're good press rushers, yeah. but it's not this kind of super dynamic, immediate win type of group. Right. And Hassan Reddick can get that at times. He's the yeah, one yeah, guy absolutely. that can do that. Yeah. But well, I think Wiley right, matched like, up pretty well with them, like in yeah, the Super Bowl. It, right. And but the interior guys are just they're gonna drive you, they're 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 gonna bull rush you, do whatever, and try and drive you back. And so create it yeah. maybe. But that's what I'm wondering. Like, you know, if you're the Eagles, you can if you get that split second extra time by giving them a different look, then that you, yeah. you suddenly give these guys more chance. Well, I do think I think it's gonna be it's definitely something to be considered or concerned about if you're a commander's fan, because like, you know, this team is leading the league in sacks. And uh, like we talked about, it's not just the O-line, it's not just the quarterback, it's not just the concepts, whatever it is, it's a, it's kind of everything. But versus a powerful rush, versus a quarterback who holds the ball, who's not a big guy, like they're going to collapse that pocket on him, it's going to present challenges. So I'm really kind of curious to see what EB does and his plan to kind of m- like make that group a little bit less effective. Because I think there are some things you can do from a game plan perspective. And I think you don't have to look any farther than what the Buffalo Bills did to the Washington Commanders just last weekend. Like they 
came out <clears throat> in different personnel groupings. They ran different concepts. They ran quick game. They did all sorts of different stuff to make the rush less effective. EB, I believe, could do that same thing to Philly. I'm just curious to see how he chooses to do it. So last, last thing. When you look at this matchup, and they played the Eagles pretty well outside of the, the nine sack game last year. Yeah. Played them pretty well. Like what, you know, you're coming off a terrible loss. Yeah. And now you're going on the road against arguably the best team, one of the best teams in the league, certainly. Yeah. What do you think about this kind of a matchup in this kind of a situation? Well, I think it's good that they're that Philly is still kind of working through finding their identity a little bit offensively. I think Jalen Hurts, for whatever reason, looks a little bit unsettled. So I'm this one thing I will say about this defense is they know how to stop the run and they can stop the run if they have to. And I think versus Philly, they've done a good job of that. And if I'm Jack Del Rio, I don't want to say I'm selling the farm, but I'm mortgaging a lot of resources to making sure that they cannot run the football versus us. If they can't run the football versus us, I, as of right now, and I've said this before and I've been burned in the past, as of right now, watching Jalen Hurts through three games, I don't think he can beat you throwing the football. So I want to encourage them. I, I want to make that happen as much as I can. And if that happens, it's going to alleviate a ton of pressure on the commander's offense. They can be a little bit more conservative, run the football a little bit more, possess the football a little bit more, kind of a, in a game flow that is going to look very similar to what they had in the second game last year. I don't think they're going to run the ball that much, but I'm saying possess the football, convert on third down, and then you can get in a little bit of a slog fest because I will say in the first three games, Philly has done a great job of finding and creating turnovers, but Jalen Hurts has also turned the ball over a little bit. So if you can kind of maximize that, maximize the worst parts of Jalen Hurts, and to me that's him throwing the ball a lot, I think you can win this football game. And, and I think that's something that, that to me, that's the key, to the, the, the key to the game, quite frankly. Make Jalen Hurts beat you from the pocket. And so stop in the run, make him beat you from the pocket, and have a game plan that, offensively that relies on the defensive production. Does that make sense what I'm saying? Yes, in terms of defensive absolutely. production? Yeah. Yes. So. so, all right. So everybody, you can go listen to it, Logan's film breakdowns with Craig Hoffman on the take command podcast. That's already out. So go listen to that. Yep. Logan, you got about 25 other jobs you got going on. Uh, <laughs> in addition, by the way, you brought up coaching in high school because Logan coaches in high school too. So he's got a lot going on, but yeah. are there other, you know, your other shows with the commanders and all that? Yeah, so obviously check out the Commander's YouTube page for all of our um, command, uh, what is it, I even command center stuff, like yes. command center podcasts, command center show. We do breakdowns. We've got the game plan with Ron Rivera, which comes out on Sunday, where Coach kind of goes through film with me, which is a ton of fun. I got the pregame show on 980 at 106.7 The Fan, and our command center podcast with Fred Smoot and Santana Moss that airs on Big 100 before the game as well, so ton of stuff out there and make sure you follow me on instagram at logan underscore paulson 82 there you go logan you're the best thank you very much john thanks so much man appreciate it that's it for this episode thanks to logan for joining me and thank you as always for tuning in don't forget i'll be back on friday at friday night saturday morning with my keys and predictions for sunday's game so i'll talk to you next time